The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous supporters. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash donate. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode number 84. Hi, I'm Tom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. Today we're discussing the third Doctor story, the John Pertwee story, Doctor Who and the Silurians. And joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Good, good. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So, uh, first, let's talk about the name of this, because it's uh, an interesting departure from the (laughs) usual, and for a very funny reason. Uh, Because you don't actually usually get Doctor Who and the Silurians. It would probably normally be called the Silurians. Um, Yeah, although where you would see the Doctor Doctor Who and is on the target novelizations that became popular. It would always be Doctor Who and the something. But not normally the convention for titling an episode of the show itself. Yeah, and it, it resulted, I think, what was it from a, a, a misunderstanding or a, by the, a, the 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 company that does the the titles for the shows uh, mm. or the graphics department for the BBC that does the the credits. Um, it, they it was apparently some kind of miscommunication, and they ended up just putting Doctor Who and on it. Uh, so it was. Kind of funny, yeah. which which Not highlights deal. which highlights mm-hmm. the uh, the the difference between old who and new who, which is in old who, the, or classic who, uh, as we say, um, they they called him Doctor Who, like his name was Doctor Who, not just the Doctor. Now in the show, they often call him the Doctor, and they usually call him the Doctor, uh, but they often. You know, he's credited as the doctor in the as Doctor Who in the end credits, right. and, and there, there are even instances on the show where he'll like sign a note Doctor W, or once <laughs> Patrick Troughton passed himself off as uh, as a German speaker and he referred to himself as Doctor von Ver, which is <laughs> yeah, German Doctor for Who. Doctor Who. <laughs> uh, and in fact, uh, it, the the license plate on uh, the third Doctor's car that we see in this. Uh, Bessie. Bessie, yeah, it is mm-hmm. who won uh, WHO number one. Uh, so they, whereas in New Who, they, they very, they, they never refer to him as Doctor Who as his name. They, they until, ref- until, until the very end of the Peter Capaldi era, yeah. where Missy outs the fact that he's called Doctor Who and he picked the name himself, she says. And yeah. Peter yep. Capaldi doesn't deny it. <laughs> and so this really, the the whole thing that Doctor Who is is not an appropriate reference for him, that it's he's, he's just the Doctor, that's a fan theory that really is not <laughs> part of the show itself. Right, right, exactly. Um, so, uh, so that's, so that's the, the title. Um, now, well, there's another aspect of the yep. title, too, which was what I initially thought you were going to go for. The Silurians. Yes, that so, was going to go to next. So the Silurian. Now, there is a real period in the Earth's history called the Silurian period. Mm-hmm. And um, it's named after the Silures, which were a Celtic tribe in southeast Wales. Um, but the thing is, it was 430 million years ago, not the 200 million years ago mentioned on the show. And it was an era where they had, where there were fish, but there were no dinosaurs and no reptiles. And so Mm. it's inappropriate to have reptiles like the Silurians in this episode in the Silurian period. They should be from much later. You mean they got the science wrong in this episode? (laughs) Uh, Well, and not only in respect to that, but we'll talk about that later. I was looking at that. I was looking at that. So they should have been called the Jurassicans. 
something like that. <laughs> yeah. The uh, uh at least the Mesozoians or something. Yeah. Um the also I want to know how when Doctor Who first meets a Silurian, he says, Are you a Silurian? And the guy says, Yes. It's like, how does this guy speak English? <laughs> <laughs> it's the TARDIS. I mean, well, it's the TARDIS. Okay, I get I, I can buy that, but it just seems out of the I mean, this well, is a name that they just came up with themselves. Right. It's a newly newly minted word, but I guess maybe the TARDIS can translate newly minted words into other languages. Well, it doesn't the, explain the broken how TARDIS, the yeah. broken TARDIS that's miles away because it's sitting at unit headquarters instead of this facility. Well, we well, also will bring up that major Baker has never been in the TARDIS and he still understands them. So <laughs> we'll yeah, just, we'll little, just walk away little, from that <laughs> little sketchy. Um, <laughs> one, well, there was one other thing about that. Um, but I don't remember. It'll have to come back to me. Well, I want to mention like so, about the Silurians and this idea of uh, a, a a race based on di- you know the, of descended from dinosaurs or connected to dinosaurs uh, mm-hmm. that cr- created a civilization, um, and that that disappeared or went underground mm-hmm. literally, uh, and, and then a, a human civilization grew up after them. That mm-hmm. actually is, it's actually scientifically plausible according to some recent research i saw this article mm-hmm. i talked about it on starquest headlines uh plug the show uh recently this article which said that um the, the scientists they kind of looked at the idea was in in the span of time we're talking about which is hundreds of millions of years in, in hundreds of millions of years if human civilization died today there would be no trace of us mm-hmm. in 200 million years so there would be no our buildings our cars all the things that we think are very permanent would be gone except for things like even things like radioactive waste and that sort of stuff over the, over that kind of geologic time span would tend to go away. There might be some things left, but given the size it wouldn't of be obvious, right. Given the size no. of the planet, it's, it's, it's more than a needle in a haystack that we'd stumble on that one thing somewhere. Uh, yeah. So it's plausible <laughs> that there could have been a, another civilization that predated humans. And this is, in fact, something that's explored in a lot of science fiction. H.P. Lovecraft has multiple uh, pre-human civilizations. Um, And there's that episode of Star Trek Voyager that is weirdly similar to uh, <laughs> to the Silurians in that yes. it posits a race of dinosaurs, previous sentient dinosaurs previously lived on Earth. And it's like, wow, Doctor Who totally ripped off Voyager in its timey-wimey way several decades yeah. early. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although it was an interesting – I remember that episode. I saw it not too long ago. And it was an interesting in its way because it, I mean, this isn't uh, Secrets of Star Trek. That's coming up later this summer. But uh, but it was interesting in its own way in that um, it approached the idea of this sort of this – the orthodoxy of science and the things that you know scientists are allowed to research and – and that sort of stuff, and to believe that humans could have descended from from us, you know, the sort of thing. What it was, uh, or, or replaced us on Earth, uh, uh, us being the dinosaur people. It was funny, but um, but it was dinosaurs on a spaceship, which also uh, actually that actually oh, predated yeah. dinosaurs on a spaceship. That, then that, predated. yeah, let's not go there. We, we shouldn't <laughs> have stolen so that. The, so, the, so the first time <laughs> Doctor Who ripped off Voyager, it worked, but not the second. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> One too many bites from the apple. So speaking of, okay, and then speaking of the Silurians, um, New Who has Silurians too, and they've been a prominent recurring creatures. Uh, in fact, uh, very popular, uh, at least one of them um, mm-hmm. in the, what, what the, that's the something something gang. What is it? Not the apple dumpling gang. The Paternoster gang. The Paternoster gang, which I should remember because Paternoster is Latin for our father and it's our prayer. But, um, mm-hmm. but the Silurians are somewhat different of course the modern yeah, Silurians but- and they explain that as being a different branch of the Silurian family and right. that's actually something they do in uh the John Pertwee era because later mm-hmm. he meets another aquatic branch of the Silurian family who were the sea devils uh, so there's precedent in in classic who for that and, but there is um Visual similarity. I mean, not a lot, but the, you could see definite connections between the two. If you put the the the, the masks from the, the from each time side by side, you could see that there's some some connection between them. So I thought that was interesting. And and yeah, we'll talk a little it, more about it as we go on. There's actually some uh, just about new 
Solarians versus old Solarians, but I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, one one thing that the new ones don't have is the magic third eye <laughs> yeah. that does all <laughs> kinds of different things. It's a head blaster, which yep. makes me wonder why do they bother maiming people with their claws, yep. as we're told right. they do. It makes force fields. Again, why bother maiming anybody? It disintegrates and melts rock and doors, but not humans. And it rematerializes walls. Yes. So oh, and it's don't, like, don't forget, it also operates their technology. Yeah, it operates yeah. their technology. It opens, so it's it like, unlocks the door. I want to know how this third eye evolved. It's essentially an ancient Amazon Echo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's home kit for the Silurians. They, can, uh, they <laughs> can control everything. Maybe it's trans-Silurianism. <laughs> and these are, these, are, these are the cyber-Silurians. Ah, yes, cyber-Silurians. That's coming. Uh, so that's the Silurians. So one other thing I want to kind of preface this, the, our discussion with is, is another element of the show that's not a part of the story, which is the bizarre music. Oh the, yeah, the kazoos and the it, it, like all the sorts of like clarinets, recorders, cellos, and horns. It was all this yeah. bizarre music. What yeah, was that about? The, every time, the, well, every time the Silurians would show up, it was almost you know it was type of music you would usually hear for something campy. Yeah, at least we would only only, only campy. creepy, only yeah. creepy as yeah. this weirdly annoying clarinet. And yeah. uh, and I I was reading uh, about this episode, and apparently they were like trying out a new musician to score it or something, and he just had way different sensibilities than the people who normally <laughs> score the show. <laughs> yes, uh, his name was uh, Carrie Blyton, uh, was, uh, was the, the, the name I, I found. Uh, very strange. It almost took me out of it at times, I have to say, because it was very... Oh, totally. Very, very, very discordant, very annoying sounds, mm -hmm. I have to say. Mm -hmm. And that combined with the sound effects of the Silurian technology and their, their little third eye gadget um was like oh man i just want to can, can i just watch it on subtitled <laughs> at some yeah, point yeah there was there's was, there's was one point where i actually about hit the mute button on my sound system because it yeah. was so painful i mean really <laughs> yeah, right so yeah. and we're we're saying this but we all i think and i, I know dom did and i know yeah. i did father you can correct me if i'm wrong about this we actually enjoyed this episode oh like, yeah story. No, I, I enjoyed Definitely. it i enjoyed it very much it's just yeah there's these little tweaks where it's just like that that's odd. Yeah. <laughs> why did they choose yeah. that? Even for the sixties and the seventies, why did they choose that? <laughs> yeah, a this time was of 70s experimentation. When this one came out. Yeah, yeah. So this aired uh, January through March of nineteen seventy. It was in mm -hmm. its seven episodes within the the whole st story serial. Um, and it's the second third Doctor adventure. It's the yes. first thing mm -hmm. after Spearhead from Space. So we we have our new assistant that we met in Spearhead from Space, Liz Shaw, yep. who mm -hmm. is kind of like a 20th century version of Zoe. She's a scientist. She's kind of an equal to the Doctor in some ways. And like she gets to do forensic tests in this episode. The Doctor entrusts her with mm -hmm. doing forensic tests yeah. and things. Um, we also get the first appearance of Bessie, the doctor's uh, magical car, um, <laughs> Roadster, bright yes. yellow Roadster. Um, he had previously, in Spearhead from Space, borrowed someone's car and really liked it and wondered if he could have it. And the Briggs said no, but but they might arrange something. And so now he has Bessie and he's tweaking her up as we begin the episode. See, now I was, I was curious uh, what Bessie was, you know, was Bessie a, a car model that was produced? And actually it wasn't, it was a, a custom made uh, kit uh, started with a 1954 Ford popular, which of course was not a Ford vehicle that was produced here in the States, but yeah. it was very popular in <laughs> Great Britain. Um, and then it had a fiberglass body that was custom built to look like the old style roadster. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. It goes apparently very fast. And the doctor is a, is a bit of hell on wheels, shall we say? <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> they, they later introduce other features. It has like it can it's self-driving and mm. it's remote controlled and it also has inertial dampers so that if you're going along at 90 miles an hour you can stop on a dime without being thrown out of the vehicle so <laughs> night night rider ripped off bessie yes yeah which is where it speak <laughs> all the ways that doctor who sort of was no, the this, groundbreaking <laughs> for all science fiction that followed yeah this is, this is but this is a time travel show i think it i i think it's always the other way around doctor who ripped off night rider there we go <laughs> yeah so um, 
so the, as the as the, the 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 story begins, we have this um, these two guys climbing down into a cave uh, system, and we have that classic moment of what's that awful sound that we shouldn't be finding in this place? It's very strange. I don't know. Let's go check. I'm sure it's nothing. <laughs> Rawr! <laughs> Giant dinosaur yeah, exactly. leaps out and eats yeah. them. Um, and apparently they're they're not the only guys who have disappeared in these caves as well, which are nearby a a brand new experimental nuclear power research station. Um, yeah, and as we a, go on, I'm going to have a lot to say about this nuclear <laughs> research station. Um, At Wendley the, Moore, which is... Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Do, do we know where is that a real place, Wenley Moore? Um, I think I looked it up. I don't think it is, oh, okay. but I could be mistaken. What? So the first interesting thing about this nuclear power plant is we're told that it's experimental and it's safely going to convert nuclear energy directly into electrical power. Yep. And you might wonder, well, wait, isn't converting nuclear energy into electrical power the purpose of a nuclear reactor? Mm-hmm. And and at least a commercial power plant one. Yeah. And yes, it is. But normally it's mediated in some way. Typically what happens the way the way po- nuclear power plants work is you have a fissile material like uranium or plutonium. And it em- as it decays, it emits neutrons and heat. And then you take that heat and use it to drive a. Um, uh, a steam a, cycle. A, 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 yeah, yeah. You, you use it to heat water, which then drives a, a dynamo and converts the heat energy into electrical energy. Exactly. So apparently what this does, and I have no idea how they do this, but apparently this takes the heat that is generated by the fissile material, which we're later told is uranium in this case, and somehow directly converts it into electrical power without the mediation of a of a steam of a steam cycle. Well, it, th- that's actually that is a thing. It's called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which is the sort of nuclear power that they use in space, like in satel- mm-hmm. you know, satellites and or deep space probes usually. Um, okay. Uh, but, yeah, that would it, make sense. But it doesn't work. But that's so. There's a thing that converts. Uh, a radiation heat into electricity, but it's not this <laughs> what that yeah. they're and, talking about. The show. It, it works on yeah. a scale that is would be widely in wildly inefficient for something like this, because yes. you look at the amount of power, for example, like the Voyager spacecraft use this. And that's the only reason why they're still operating today, although at a limited state. And I think I can't remember off the top of my head, but I want to say the Voyager used like 400 watts of electricity total yeah Mm -hmm. probably less than your computer on your desk yeah (laughs) that that actually may explain something in this because at one point they're reading um they're talking about they're they're reading off numbers about what how much energy the nuclear power plant is making and they're saying that it's making two thousand million electron volts and or, or in American terms, two billion electron volts. Yeah. And and they're saying that because two billion is a big number and electron volt sounds really scientific and impressive. <laughs> but actually, electron volts are tiny, tiny things. And so if this thing were making two billion electron volts a second. That would be 30 billionths of a single watt of power. <laughs> and uh, it would need to it would need to make 30 billion times more electron volts to just generate one watt of power to light up and a diode. Told, <laughs> yeah, and we're told at this point that it's functioning perfectly and all systems are normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the funny things about the uh, the radioisotope generators is that um they're general. They 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 weren't they weren't necessarily safe to be around. Like like you wouldn't. Mm-mm. They they would. That's why they put them on satellites and space probes. The Soviets used them in unmanned remote lighthouses uh, built inside the Arctic Circle. I just, mm. The Soviets and nuclear power were just they they just love the idea of nuclear power and they put it everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but um, but yeah. So the the you know they talk about in in the, in this episode they talk about. Um, it ha- it's based on a cyclotron or a proton accelerator. It's all gobbledygook. It's, it's all just yeah. science, science <laughs> t- 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 nonsense. That's really not based on anything. Yeah, it's all techno babble. 
Um, so I just, yeah, you're right, Jimmy. Like the, the the science concerning this, and then even later on, um, uh, near the end, they have oh, what was it? Well, there are um, a couple things near the end. Uh, one of them is they get the Van Allen belts wrong. You know, they're talking about the Van Allen <laughs> yes. belts, and they screen out. They say they screen out part of the sun's radiation. No, they the Van Allen belts stop high energy particles like electrons, but they don't stop heat. Right. They don't. Um, they're not keeping and, the Earth from getting too hot. <laughs> right. And 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 then they also talk about m- microwaves dispersing molecules in the Van Allen belt. Yeah. And it's like, okay, this, it, no. that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> the other thing, and I was going to save this for later, but I'll just talk about it right now. Um, the, the, the crisis they have, and this is where I'm, I'm less familiar with how atomic energy on space probes work, but I know something about how nuclear power plants work. Yeah. And the crisis that the doctor engineers with this power plant is all wrong. Exactly opposite. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's exactly yeah. the opposite of what you would expect. Because oh, right. the, the, the way a nuclear pile like this works is you have your fissile material, in this case uranium rods, um, in, uh, in a light water reactor, for example, in uh, another medium that moderates the... Um, the speed of the neutrons they're emitting and slows them down. So it causes more interactions. Usually a pool of liquid. Yeah. Yeah. A pool of liquid. Sometimes it'll be something else. Like you can't have molten salt reactors, but which are actually safer. Um, But in this case, it's got rods. It's, they're going to be in a uh, moderating material like water. And then you have control rods, say made out of graphite or something Mm -hmm. that will dampen and absorb neutrons and shut down the reaction. And so what the doctor has Liz do is put the control rods. He tells her, start putting them into the reactor. And when I say go drop all of them in, and it will cause a runaway reaction, which it then does. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 then the Silurians demand yank the uranium out of the reactor to shut down the runaway reaction. That is not what you do. You put the fissile material in there and you leave it in for years and you raise and lower the control rods right. that shut down the reaction. What the doctor should have said was yank all of the control rods out Mm-hmm. And the Silurian should have demanded that the control rods be put back in. You, in particular, don't want to be having your reaction controlled by raisable, your, by raisable uranium rods, because if you yank them all out at once, then you you can just have the same reaction happening to some extent in the air. Mm-hmm. What you really want is the control rods above the assembly so that you can drop them in all of a sudden if you get a runaway reaction and gravity itself will yank them down and shut down the reaction. So this has been the secrets of nuclear power. (laughs) 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 No, but it's, but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's actually interesting to, to, because again, Doctor Who is conceived as a educational show, at least at this, I think still at this point in its, in its incarnation. Um, for kids about science and history. And the, in this case, they got the, the, the science completely well, wrong. You know, but it, it shows yeah. the, the, the perils of an episodic TV show because, you know, we talked about the Aztecs and we talked about how they went to great pains to make sure that the history was somewhat accurate. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get this where they apparently read a, you know, boys, you know, Boy Scout magazine level <laughs> article on nuclear <laughs> energy and didn't even get that right. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah. But by the way, if you want to read a really fun book, and he's actually got more than one, but if you want to read a really fun book about nuclear power, um, there's a book called Atomic Accidents by a nuclear engineer named James Mahaffey. And mm. it's a lot of fun. It's also it's also one of those things. It's like watching a train wreck. In fact, he talks about how people <laughs> used to watch train wrecks for fun. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> they would stage them. And um, but in each chapter, he takes on a different type of accident that can occur with nuclear stuff. And oh, wow. you're just watching people heading towards the the accident you know is coming up. Yep. And it's a fairly new book because it uh, it it go- covers from. Says from the Ozark Mountains to Fukushima, which is just a few years ago. So yeah. mm-hmm. the Fukushima disaster after the tsunami. So that's a that's a relatively new book. So that I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes and uh, 
uh, people can uh, pick that up if they're interested. So, um, so that's the science. That's the music. Uh, the Silurians. Let's talk about the story itself and the the setting. Like we, you just mentioned before, Jimmy, that this is the first third Doctor story after the regeneration. And as we we've learned with regenerations, that that first story, the Doctor is kind of wacky, and it's not until mm-hmm. after that that they really kind of settles in, and now we get the new personality of the Doctor. Um, and so we're we're getting to know the third Doctor in this episode, um, and in his new situation which is he's stuck on earth the tardis mm-hmm. is non-existent uh you know it, practically it's in this ultimate of, the ultimate of tardis separation syndrome <laughs> exactly yeah, it doesn't even it, it doesn't even appear in this story right right which is kind of funny given how iconic literally the 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 tardis is mm-hmm. um and so and the doctor is now part of unit and in fact like it's very interesting to see how the brigadier uh, takes command of the doctor. He orders him around, and 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 it's uh, it's very interesting to see that the, the the doctor in that circumstance, and that that very much is a part of the the John Pertwee era where you'll have that interaction between the brigadier and the doctor, where the brigadier will tell the doctor to do something, and the doctor will just look at him like you're kidding, right? <laughs> yes, and then ignore yeah. him and do and do whatever he wants. What what's nice though is even though the brigadier does you know he does take command and he does try to order the doctor around he also backs the doctor up yes oh, when yes. when other people are having a problem with the doctor it's like this is my man he has the authority to do this deal with it mm-hmm. uh, yes especially in this episode with uh, what is the name of the doctor Lawrence he's the oh. head head of the facility and this guy so this is another story in which. Science and science with the the dangers of runaway science is really the mm-hmm. the message, and we got this in the uh, the 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 fourth doctor's first story, uh, the robot, uh, and but so this comes before, but it's still the same, which is you know the, this doctor who is his only concern is the the research into this nuclear power plant that he's doing and the impact it will have on his career. And science, 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 and and right to the end, he de- he is in complete denial of yeah. of the of the existence of the Salarians, despite the, all the evidence, all the science that shows him otherwise. And in fact, dies literally dies from his denial because he contracts mm-hmm. the disease and refuses to believe it. Um, what what I one thing and he's he's a way overblown character um, mm-hmm. and I think yeah. it's I think to the point that it's a flaw in the writing. But one, one thing that I do like about it is he's not simply motivated by ideology. He's mm-hmm. not into like science must be advanced at all costs. Right. It's my career right. must be advanced at all costs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. In uh, in the. Um, in the guise of you know uh, advancement of science, but really, you know, we've I've sunk my career into this. We've sunk millions of pounds of this, and it's sort of in some ways it's um it's it's a it's a cautionary tale about the sort of thing that destroyed the the space shuttle Columbia, uh, which was mm-hmm. the inertia of uh of of the system, you know, of the mm-hmm. sunk sunk cost fallacy. We might what we might say, which is that um. Once we've spent all this money, once we've spent all this time and all of our effort, we can't just abandon the you know what we've done. Right. When even when everything says we have to abandon. This. Yeah, yeah. The, the, we're we're outside of the the normal range that we should be at. We we shouldn't. We really you know for for safety's sake, we should push off to another day. But we're here. We're ready. We spent all this time. We spent right. all this money. We've done all the checks. Let's go. Right. And if we don't and if we don't continue, we will lose money. We will lose time. We will lose face or whatever. Yep. And and that, so it, it's the sunk cost fallacy, it's called. That actually happened with one of the early H-bomb tests in the Pacific, which you can read about in a really fun book by James Mahaffey <laughs> called Atomic <laughs> Accidents. <laughs> I'm sure the sunk cost fallacy shows it quite a bit when it comes to things like the atomic accidents, because it it becomes even more difficult to separate yourself from that the 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 higher the stakes the big the bigger the stakes the more the the, that fallacy grabs hold i think well it's Uh, it's it's human nature though that we can get so fixated on what we see as the goal as what we have to do we must push forward we must you know and we start getting the blinders so all we see is what we're 
striving towards and we lose sight of everything else. You hear so many people that they get so caught up in their work that everything else in their life falls apart. You right. know, and that, that's kind of what this Lawrence character is like, is he's so caught up in his work in doing what he wants to what he thinks is right to do that he loses sight of everything else in the world. Well, in fact, at one point, he says, the knowledge I shall gain is worth any risk. I mean, as soon as I hear anybody yeah. say that, yeah. that's w- warning signs. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've, you've become psychotic now, haven't you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. Very typical uh, TV overreaching scientist. Uh, in in that case. So one of the things that's interesting about this show is um, the, the complexity of the plot. Yes. Because we have, um, I mean, they it, it even though it's seven episodes long, it's not just running through corridors. No. We have a lot of reversals. Um, the Silurians have like awoken from their suspended animation or they've begun to. And mm-hmm. they've made a deal. We don't know this at first, but they've made a deal with one of the scientists, not the director, but with one of the scientists at the plant. And they've promised him, you know, fancy knowledge in exchange for his help. So he's actually working with them, and they suspect early on this is some that the problems are some kind of an inside job, which they turn out to be. But this scientist has actually never seen the Silurians. They've just like talked to him over a loudspeaker, mm-hmm. and I kind of wonder, you know, how that worked. Uh, I don't generally negotiate with people, especially on something like this, if I can't <laughs> right. see them. Right. Um, but that gives you an illustration of how kind of Byzantine a little bit of this is. Mm-hmm. Right. So he's working with the Silurians and he's running interference. They need the 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 power from the plant. The plant was what their their hibernation chambers malfunctioned. They were supposed to wake them up many centuries or millions of years earlier than it did. Mm-hmm. Uh, they went into the chambers because they detected a planetary body about to impact the Earth. Turns the out moon. it was the, the doctor says that was the moon. It is centered orbit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, like you, your big mistake. You, it was your, you know, it was that. Um, Apparently they were great engineers, but lousy astronomers because <laughs> as the moon approached, they could build all these chambers, but they couldn't predict that it was going to come into a stable orbit. Well, apparently they weren't yeah. such good, great engineers either because the chambers malfunctioned and kept them in yeah. hibernation. Yeah. They were only supposed to be under for like a hundred years or something like that. And ended up being for like a hundred million. million. Yeah. hundred like, million. Yeah. And so this oh, new we re- added a few extra zeros. Oops. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. And then they built this reactor. Oh, by the way, building a reactor, like a nuclear reactor, on top of a, an extensive cave system, bad idea. That's just yeah. not. That's not a, a, a. That's not indicated. Let's just say <laughs> that's yeah. a that's a that's a fault waiting to happen. So uh, the the somehow the energy. And again, I'm not sure how this is because you wouldn't be letting radiation out of the reactor. But somehow the energy being generated activated the chambers, woke some of the um, Silurians. They wanted more energy, uh, but that was causing disruptions in the plant. And so this Dr. Quinn was sort of running interference for them with, with to kind of hide them while also trying to get the, the information from them. Uh, his assistant was in on it. She knew, uh, but she was the only one. And um, he gets discovered. The doctor kind of figures out he, um, and the, the interesting thing is, is we don't actually see a Silurian in this until I think the fourth episode. Mm-hmm. Is that mm-hmm. correct? You I see, mean, for, you see the claw it, for a while, a bit. Of yeah, it, but that's about it. I think we may have the reveal. Typically, the monster reveal is one of the cliffhangers. I think it may be yeah. like the the third episode cliffhanger, and then we see him in the fourth, or mm-hmm. maybe it's one episode later. Yeah, but one of one of them gets loose. Uh, there it gets separated and goes. Uh, is is on the surface and running around and hiding mm-hmm. and he ends up killing a west country yokel and that's another trope in these john pertwee episodes all kinds of john pertwee episodes have comedy west country yokels who frequently <laughs> get killed right. uh, we had we had the the welsh poacher in the mm-hmm. in spearhead from space we've got a a farmer mm-hmm. in this episode and we there and there will be others. Uh, there's right. even one in the tenth anniversary special. Um, and so he dies, and his his wife sees the Silurian before we do, and ends up like hysterical and in the hospital. And actually, I thought the ter- I have a note that I thought the terrified woman in the hospital was actually very effective. Yes. Um, 
and and the doctor and Liz come to see her and try to get information and so forth. So the and the doctor's response is very is very typical for the doctor and it's sort of a, the hallmark of the character, which is he almost never sees the 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 monster of the episode as a monster. He always sees mm-hmm. them as pe- people that we can connect with, and if we could just create understanding. We'll be right. we'll all be better off and we'll we'll diffuse the situation. And so he he, pr- he sees them, presumes to be them to be intelligent and peaceful at heart and, and tries to negotiate a peace. It's very interesting. He calls them throughout aliens. But mm-hmm. but well, I don't they're their original natives. <laughs> yeah. Right? So I wonder, like, I mean, but I also think he under, he knows that they're from the planet. So I, I think he just he's using aliens as sort of just another way of saying instead of saying monster, maybe. Right, I guess. not human, yeah. not human. Right, right. Yeah. Um, kind of, kind of more, more classic sense of alien as you know, not, not of the dominant locals, if you will. You know? Right, yeah. right. I'm, not, I'm struggling how foreigner. to say it, but you know, alien to foreign culture. Yeah, yeah, foreigners. Yeah. yeah, or and it originally meant foreigner, and then it came or other, and it came to meant strange stranger or something like that i guess that's mm-hmm. the sense he's using it here and he actually is able in talking to the leader of the slurians to make some progress mm-hmm. um right. the leader is open to the idea of negotiating of negotiating the doctor wins him over he he's gonna have to convince his his fellow slurians though to go along with this and their internal tensions in the Silurian community. And, and I like that you have, because it shows that they're not all monolithic. They're yes. not all these noble, perfect people. Neither are they just pure evil. They, they're like us. And, and the episode very definitely plays with these are just men in another skin from another time in earth's history. Right. But they have the same kind of motives and foibles and possibilities that we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I noticed when uh, they were interrogating Major Baker, they wanted to know about our weaponry, one, like the ones who are uh, looking to defeat us. And right. uh, they, you know, do, does everyone have these guns? And Baker says, "Of course not. Just the military does." And I'm thinking, well, there's a Second Amendment uh, argument. You know, in case <laughs> yeah. aliens rise up from the earth, we should all be armed. <laughs> let's, let's like come up in Texas. We'll show them what for. Uh, so I thought that was a, an interesting moment. Um, and then we have. Uh, this the, as we f- the plot further proceeds, I mean, we're kind of skipping a lot of stuff that happens. It's seven uh, episodes, we have to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't want to sit here for for two hours, folks. We'll we'll keep it as short as we can. But uh, the the Silurians who are uh, in favor of conquering uh, humans as opposed to living in peace with them, they release a plague. And I thought yeah. it was fascinating that they actually this this play gets out and and starts oh, killing yeah. lots of people in London. I thought it was fascinating that they just they went in that dramatic direction. To, yeah, to let it get lethal out. Lethal bio, lethal biological warfare on a children's show. Yes, I mean mm-hmm. people dropping dead in the train stations and on the streets of London. And they we, show like multiple we, people. We could have done without the the ridiculous scene of the doctor mix whipping up the the antidote. <laughs> Well, I thought that was very interesting, which is not usually, especially like in, in New Who or even in just in new, you know, modern TV in general, uh, you know, they would they would go away uh, for a couple scenes and they'd come back and like, we've discovered the cure. Here's the cure. Mm. Or the doctor would walk up to the console and press a bunch of buttons and the cure would pop out. Of oh, the I console. just I just happen to have it sitting right here in this <laughs> handy little compartment. Yes. Whereas in this, we have like an extensive period of time where the doctor and Liz, but mostly the doctor, have to have to go through all of these drugs and test them out and uh, see which ones work. And what, you know, the, I mean, they, they make a big deal out of the fact that it's, it, they, they can't just grab something off the shelf that, that there's a lot of work that goes into it. And, and this, I actually like this about the episode. I mean, they might've executed it better, but the fact that they recognize and take dramatic time to develop a cure is is better than what we get a lot of times. Um, I mean, even because it it takes a long time to develop a new drug mm-hmm. and to test. If you've got millions of drugs to test, it takes a long time to do that too. And um, even um, by real world standards, even what we see in this episode is magically fast. Yeah, but at yes. least but at least they they took more time than yeah. than just a scene or two for it. Oh no, no, I definitely I definitely agree with that. I mean that it it's it it was 
that aspect it was good that they that they showed that this wasn't a he happens to grab the right bottle immediately and this is it this right. is the one that will do it but more of how they they yes. did, they could have done it other ways that could have still showed that without the ridiculousness of the doctor looking in the microscope and <laughs> pulling out the little droppers and you know well and seeing something happen on screen that that is like some things are like expanding or like liquids of, do, of interacting, and it's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That's I have no idea what's the, the, what that is. The, is that good? The, the Jefferson, <laughs> the Jefferson airplane psychedelic uh, <laughs> graphic on the screen. Right, right. That's the thing. So um, I agree with you. That could have been executed a little better. And, and again, it's part of this is the um, the idea of the the length of time that they have seven episodes and so some of this stuff does get stretched out a bit they i think they there was some some uh vamping a little bit in in these episodes uh, at times so uh you know they could have they could have made it a little tighter uh if, if they if they didn't have to fill so much time but uh one of the things that at the end i wanted to talk about uh is um, oh, by the way, when the doctor discovers a cure, which is um, one of my notes, he does say Eureka, which I just, that's so old yeah. fashioned. I love that. Uh, it's, but, um, and he says, uh, at one point he says to Liz in that looking for the, the cure, he says, I'm beginning to lose confidence for the first time in my life. And that covers several thousand years, which is yeah. interesting. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's, the, so that's a piece of data that's inconsistent with the uh, normal discussions of the doctor's age, mm -hmm. because um, previously, uh, and we just commented on this recently when we did Tomb of the Cyberman, that had yep. the first reference to the doctor's age, and the doctor said he was 400 and something years. Right. right. But now John Pertwee is claiming it's thousands. Well, right. and then, and of course, it's inconsistent later, because then the, as you get into Tom Baker, fit. it's Tom Baker, 700. 700 by uh, Sylvester McCoy. He's 900. Right. Right. So, um, and then, and then Stephen Moffat comes along and goes crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's a, he's a, a billion years older or something or not, but the, um, so in the end, what we have is uh, the doctor has the cure they trick the Silorians into going back into hibernation um, with, 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 you know, they make it look like the reactor is going to go critical. And so they trick them to go back into their, their, uh, their hibernation pods. Yeah. Well, um, the reactor does go critical. They make it look like it's going to blow up. Right. That's right. It's, yeah. uh, that's more precise. And, um, and, oh, it's and in, in that, in after, after they've tricked the Silurians, the doctor then has the task of how do we, how do we defuse this situation we've created with the reactor? And it's not as simple as just flipping a switch for some reason. I don't know why. If you can flip switches to make it go critical, why can't you <laughs> do yeah. the reverse? You know, right. drop like drop in the control rods. Um, but uh, but one of the things the doctor says is I'll try fusing the control of the neutron flow. <laughs> and at least that makes some sense in this context because it is the flow of neutrons among the among yep. the rods that causes the reaction. Right, right. And so he, he does it by unplugging all the the components of the control center and switching them around. Yeah. I love that these two big just you know basically power strips. Well, because it's yeah. you got to reverse the polarity, of course. Well, he doesn't give that. Now that's going to become his catchphrase: reverse yes. the polarity of the neutron flow. But at least in this context, neutron flow makes sense. Right. Um, we also, as he's working on the console, get to see John Pertwee's Cobra tattoo. I noticed yep. that. <laughs> yeah, that he had from his Royal Navy days. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor with a tat. That's a good, uh, that, I like that. I like the, the fact that the doctor would regenerate with a tattoo. Just it, mm -hmm. it's a it's a little detail that would and, be fun. And fair, fairly buff too. I mean, John Pertwee had some yeah. some muscles to him too. I mean, he wasn't a yeah lightweight. under all that frou frou uh, cape and uh, ruffles. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So once they get the the Silurians back in their uh, their uh, hibernation chambers, they set it to revive fifty years from now, which is significant for New yep. Who because when we see the Silurians for the first time in New Who, it's the or uh, with uh, Matt Smith's Doctor, uh, the eleventh mm -hmm. Doctor, in the episode "The Hungry Earth," set in Wales in 
2020, which is ex- which is 50 years after this episode. So, uh, yeah. which different has... batch of Silurians, though. Right, right. Yep. But uh, I, I kind of like the fact that when they went to do the Silurians and the New Who, they 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 made that this this small reference back. Um, and then we have the ending, which is um. A dark ending for this episode. Oh yes. So mm-hmm. the doctor, you know, leaves it where you know the, with the brigadier that the you know the Solarians are in the the cave and they're there and we'll figure we need to. I'm going to go and get some some instruments. We're going to come back and figure out all this great Silorian technology. Um, but the brigadier, uh, you know, uh, probably presumably working uh, from orders from on high, decides that's it's too dangerous and they blow up the Silorians, a mass murder of this race. Uh, mm-hmm. genocide yeah and the doctor even calls it out as genocide although as we later learn it's it's not their whole race isn't gone right um but uh but it is a genocidal act and mm-hmm. that's dark on the other hand we know as the audience that actually the brigadier was right because as the after they they got into their hibernation chambers like one of them realized the reactor didn't blow up and sets about reviving the others. So it mm-hmm. was dangerous. The Silurians were planning a mass revival and they would have succeeded if mm-hmm. the doctor's plan had been left in place and they were left alone. So what's the morality of that choice by the brigadier? I, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's, I think, I think it's an ambiguous, morally ambiguous ending. I mean, on the one hand, mm-hmm. You don't you don't want to kill these people, but on the other hand, they really are hostiles. And if action mm-hmm. of some kind isn't taken, you're in big trouble. The they have just themselves released a genocidal plague that you've only now cured. Right. Well, and you you look at the way the brigadier says it. He says, "I want that Silurian base sealed permanently." That's true. He does say that. Yeah. So the intention wasn't to kill them off. The intention was to lock them in their base. Right, you know, that they would be trapped, right? Which may or may not kill them, or some, or all, or, but it's right. but the intent and, is and, to seal it. And the doctor has certainly done things like that, like with the Daleks, sealed them underground and stuff. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Um, with bombs, in fact. Yes. Yep. Uh, of course, the question then is: is you know the what is the dinosaur that they have, their pet dinosaur that they use as a security guard? Is that in a giant? Uh, hibernation chamber. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> like, no. the, the, the dino little... kind of drops out of things at a certain point. Yeah, he just shows up every once in a while as a you know in, in his little cave that he's trapped in. <laughs> well, yeah. right, it's, it's, it's like it, what's behind this door? Rawr! Oh, close yeah. that door. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it, it looks for people who haven't seen the episode yet. It looks kind. Of, I think it's probably meant to be a tyrannosaur. It looks kind of like an allosaurus or something. Yeah. Um, and so it looks like it dates from the Jurassic or the Cretaceous periods. Um, but I like the fact that that the Silurians have an allied creature that they've domesticated. This is like their mm-hmm. equivalent of a guard dog. Yes. Yep. <laughs> and 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 so that 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 makes sense. I I like that. Yes. Yep. So uh anything else you uh want, we want to say about this uh about this episode? Uh any no. any notes that we want to pull out on this? The only, only I, thing I can say is I want that magic red liquid that the doctor poured into Bessie's radiator that went all the way through the car and fixed whatever was wrong with it. Although <laughs> usually the exhaust pipe. Yeah, yeah. But usually if you have a fluid that goes from your radiator to your exhaust pipe, that's a bigger problem called it, you know, like yeah. a, <laughs> <laughs> called yeah. a leaky radiator leaking into your cylinders. Yeah. Not happy. That would not be good. Um, maybe it's smart puddle. Yeah, <laughs> I I uh, I have a few notes. Um, a character that's like a government minister named Masters. Yes, is played by Jeffrey Palmer, and that was a treat for me because he is uh, also on the Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin and a bunch of other stuff. Mm-hmm. But I know him as Uncle Jimmy from the Fall and Rise of Reginald mm-hmm. Perrin, and on that show. He's always saying things like he plays a military man and he's always saying things like there was kind of a cock up on the catering front. Any chance of some free nosh? So he's like trying, always trying to bum food off of people. And as and as masters, the first thing he does is ask if he can have coffee. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So I like that. Um, 
Uh, I liked a line between two of the Silurians uh, where one of them says to the other, as a scientist, what have you discovered about this weapon? And I just love the cheesiness of the dialogue, yeah. forcing the exposition, telling us this guy's a scientist. Oh, come on. Um, now, we always see that. Now, now, as an apologist, Jimmy, what do you think about... No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do get that sometimes. Oh, but sure. <laughs> it, it still comes across as uh, as as cheesy. Um, I thought it was interesting. The Silurians have one of those great sci-fi tropes. Uh, they have an omniscient viewing scope. Yes. That was mm. like no material apparatus on the other end, like no camera. Somewhere yeah. they can still view what's happening in remote locations. <laughs> right. But apparently they don't monitor it very well because the doctor is able to sneak around and do things and ultimately defeat them that they should have known about. Um, there's a guard that's chewing bubble gum and blows a bubble and pops it. Mm -hmm. that yeah. I thought was a nice touch. The, yep. the unit guards in this um, are not all that good. <laughs> they're <laughs> terrible sentries. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, they're getting eaten by dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. They I, must have been from the intelligence force, not the uh, infantry. Yes, yes, must be. Yeah. Uh, there's a moment where uh, a paper, a newspaper calls the base, and the doctor says, the daily what? And I assume that's a reference to the Daily Mail, which right. is a prominent paper in England. Yep. Um, there's a moment where, so at one point outside the lab where the doctor is finding the cure to the plague, um, a Silurian appears and there's a hu and makes a huge scorch mark on the wall mm -hmm. and kills a guard. And then Liz passes through that same hallway and doesn't pass the dead man or the scorch mark and notice <laughs> that there's a problem. Um, so that's weird. They also, uh, at one point, the brigadier may show evidence of having an omniscient scope as well, because he somehow knows the Silurians have jammed the lift, even though he has no on-screen way of knowing that. Um, and lastly, the Silurians uh, seem to not, understand the Van Allen belts and imply which would imply they didn't exist in their time but actually the Van Allen belts are formed by the earth's magnetic field being hit by the solar wind and so the they would have existed in the Silurian's time okay so those are my notes but lots of little flaws mm -hmm. but I still thought it was overall an enjoyable story by the way, Jeffrey Palmer uh, is also in uh, New Who, uh, an episode right. in the, the Voyage of the Damned, which uh, features mm. a, the Space Titanic and Kylie oh, yeah. Minogue, <laughs> yep. which is a, a, a Christmas episode. Um, a couple, one thing I thought was in, interesting, just yeah. one, one phrase that they use, they call it potholing, which we yes. call yeah, spelunking, yes. cave diving or yeah. caving. Yeah. The uh, yeah, uh, uh, the Americans we we tend to pick up words from other languages like French or German or uh, you know Italian. This is whereas uh, English often, except for when it comes to food, stick to very Anglo-Saxon words uh, for things. Mm -hmm. uh, although with food, they prefer the French, where we would say eggplant, they would say aubergine, that sort of thing, or or other things like ketchup, which is actually mm -hmm. a Malay word. Right, right. Only it's not tomato ketchup. Yes, in in Malaysia. <laughs> um so if the, let's see this and just to kind of go back to a point where we talked about the TARDIS not showing up there were, this is only one of one of only nine episodes uh, stories in Doctor Who to not feature the TARDIS at all. Uh, Jimmy can you name them all? No. <laughs> <laughs> I I will I will read the list. It's Mission to the Unknowns, The Mind of Evil, The Demons, The Sea Devils, which also as you said features uh, Silurians. The Sontaran Experiment, Genesis of the Daleks, which we've recently talked right. about, Midnight, which is a classic New Who, and The Lie mm -hmm. of the Land, uh, which I'm not sure which one that, that Which is. was lame. That's part of the Monks trilogy in, uh, oh, in that's right. Final Capaldi. Yeah. Oh, season. right, 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 right. Uh, yes, that's why I didn't remember it. Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess that's, uh, that's all we have to say about it. I mean, there's so much more. Like we said, it's seven episodes, and it's a good episode. I mean, I that's my assessment is I, I enjoyed the story mm -hmm. to whatever, you know, minor failings we were willing to, 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 to live with. Um, yeah, what is, do you, you know, final reaction? I, I know, Jimmy, you said you like it. Final reaction, mm -hmm. Father, anything? I, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I really did enjoy it. I mean, yeah, it did have a little bit of the cheese, but it was – 
very very enjoyable episode and and you know nice thing of course it was an episode that moved along pretty quickly so it, you know it, it wasn't a grueling time to watch right okay so that's it from us i guess uh what did you think of this third doctor story doctor who and the silurians let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the secrets of doctor who facebook page and leaving some feedback or send us an email to doctor who at sqpn.com you can find links to all our personal social media and websites on our show notes on sqpn.com. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the finale of Rose in, in as a new Who companion in Army of Ghosts and Doomsday. Uh, and that sad farewell on the beach. Uh, until then, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you, Dom. Father Corey Stika, thank you as well. Well, thank you as well. And once again, I'm Don Bettinelli, and remember, the knowledge I shall gain is worth any risk. Or not. When will I see you again? Uh, soon, I expect. Or later. One of those.